So once a quarter, the Seventh-day Adventist Church celebrates the communion service. And I want to thank uh, the ladies. I want to thank Kay and your team. It might be just Kay. <laughs> I'd like to thank Andrew and uh, John and uh, all those who've been involved in setting up. The communion service doesn't run itself, and I'm very, very grateful for what you've done. So today I begin a three-part Bible study that's going to run uh, over the next six months during the communion services. Today we're going to look at a brief history of the foot washing service, a brief history. Number two, we're then going to, in August, this, the first Sabbath in August, look at Jesus, the bread of life and the bread of life in the communion service. Then in November, the first Sabbath in November, the first Saturday in November, we're going to look at the blood that brings life. We're going to look at the emblem of the cup. So that's where we're going in our communion services. Would you just uh, bow your heads with me and we'll pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just want to pray a blessing on this worship service today. We ask that the Holy Spirit will stir up our minds, that we might see more than we've ever seen in regard to this ordinance of humility. And we ask that you will cleanse us from sin, put us under the blood and make us totally right with you, that, our, that we might be in a frame of mind to partake of this service and receive a greater blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So I'm here today to ask you, what is the point of the foot washing service? In his most significant break with tradition yet, a few years ago, Pope Francis washed and kissed the feet of two young women at a juvenile detention centre, a surprising departure from church rules that restrict the Holy Thursday ritual to men. No Pope has ever washed the feet of a woman before, and Francis's guests just sparked a debate among some conservatives in their church and the liturgical uh, purists who lamented that the Pope had set a questionable example. Liberals welcomed the move as a sign of greater inclusiveness in the church. Speaking to the young offenders, including Muslims and Orthodox Christians, Francis said that Jesus washed the feet of his disciples on the eve of his crucifixion in a gesture of love and service. The Pope said, this is a symbol, this is a sign. Washing your feet means I am at your service. Francis told the group, aged 14 to 21, at the Casal del Marmo detention facility in Rome. He said, help one another. This is what Jesus, Jesus teaches us. This is what I do, and I do it with all my heart. I do this with my heart because it's a duty. As a priest and bishop, I must be at your service. So friends, we're not here to glorify any man. We're here to glorify Jesus in this beautiful service. But I want to ask the question again, what is the actual point of the foot washing service? And I want to ask you, why do you think the majority of Christian churches today do not celebrate the foot washing part of the Last Supper service? I'm going to ask you to talk back to me now. Many have the bread and the wine, but the foot washing service has largely disappeared. Would anyone like to venture a reason why the foot washing service is rarely celebrated? Okay, thank you, Lee. So in a selfie generation where we're taking our own photos and jumping off cliffs and stuff, um, yeah, the idea of humility, of humbling ourselves and kneeling down and washing someone's feet, that might be a new idea. Good answer. Someone else. Thank you. Amen. So for the video, Paul was just saying that many, many Christians today do not understand the meaning behind the service and they don't understand the value of that service to each individual Christian. And there might be a third answer. Gary? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good answer because of the logistics. So in terms of the water has to be brought in and it has to be heated up and 
all the things and the preparation. There's a lot of work on the local church. So Andrew, thank you to your family because this just didn't happen. It doesn't fall off the back of the truck. It's got to be prepared. Kay's had to bake the bread and we're very grateful for your participation. I was able to find out that the Brethren, the Church of the Brethren, actually still celebrate the foot washing service. So if you've got your swords there, I'm going to ask you to come back with me in the ancient biblical writings to understand a little bit more about this. Join me in the Gospel of John. Join me in John 13. If you don't have access to the Word, then it's going to be on the screen. We're going to John chapter 13. And we're picking up the story in verse 1. We're going to John 13. We're looking at verses 1 to 17 to understand more about what this service is all about. I'm going to share with you from the New King James Version, which is now on the screen. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, verse 1, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, Jesus did what? He loved them to the what? To the end. Friends, does Jesus only love you if you're good? Is he a a tough parent who only rewards good behaviour or is his love that unconditional love? It is unconditional love and he will love you to the very end of your life or the end of the age. Verse 2, and the supper being ended, this is very challenging, isn't it? The who? The devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So there is Judas thinking about how he can betray Jesus, believing Jesus will step up and use miracles and kingly power to take over the kingdom from the Romans. Verse 3. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, verse 4, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. Five, after that he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So friends, as we deconstruct this passage, what is Jesus teaching us right here? So in verse 4, he laid aside his garments, he takes a towel and girds himself and then begins to wash the disciples' feet. Do you read about the foot washing service in the Gospel of Matthew? Do you read about it in Mark? Do you read about it in Luke? It's missing. It is exclusive to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is the only place that this is mentioned. We are so blessed that we have how many accounts in the Gospels? Four accounts, four different viewpoints given to the life and ministry of Jesus. So there's a second point I'd like to raise, and that is that in verse 4, and I'm going to read it, we see there's an act of humility. It says there, that Jesus rose from supper and laid aside his garments. He took a towel and girded himself. Friends, is this the first time that Jesus had to lay aside his garments? Does anyone else know of a previous example in terms of the cosmos? One of my favourite writers says that in heaven, Jesus symbolically took off his heavenly garments to come down to planet Earth and be so helpless to be born as a baby and to be held at the breast of a human woman. It's just hard to comprehend that, isn't it? The Son of God becoming a helpless little baby in the arms of Mary and Joseph. It's absolutely incredible. So there we see, as Lee said, an act of humility of stepping down from heaven to earth and here of stepping down from being the leader of the pack, of being the master and Lord and being one of the servants. Point number three, before I go on to it, let me read to you from the Bible commentary. When Jesus was washing the dusty feet of his disciples, he was what? Fully conscious of his what? Divinity. The act was thus a supreme demonstration of his humility. 
I remember in the uh, 80s that we went to a lot of uh, conferences and many times we were hearing from Bill Hybels, who was then running the um, Willow Creek massive mega church in America. And the thing that always surprised us was that many times Bill would just sit on the stool on the stage and lecture us pastors about being a pastor. But many times he would just tell stories about himself that were quite unflattering. Now, prior to this, leaders had never really done that. Australians do. They are very self-deprecating. But it was amazing to see an American do that. And it kind of drew us to him because we could see that he was a man with similar passions to us and they had fall, fallen and failed like all of us. But Jesus had not fallen and failed, but here we have the God-man, 100% divine and 100% human. I can't work that out. I'm not even going to try, but I want to tell you that the science of salvation will go on for all eternity and we will have an opportunity to be able to talk to the Godhead about that divine formula for Jesus who was, he called himself the what? the son of man, but he was also the son of God, the son of God and the son of man. In verse 5, we find that we have the concept of service. Let's have a look at verse 5 in our Bibles. After that, Jesus poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So, friends, in terms of being a servant and service, this is quite a remarkable act because in those days, these jobs were done by servants. So you would arrive at a home in Bible times with dusty feet, with your sandals. You'd want to sit down after walking miles and miles and miles. And you would love to have on a hot day, fresh, cold water put over your feet, the dust washed off your feet, and your whole body would feel refreshed. Isn't that right? Today, uh, it's a lot different to that, that hardly anybody's walking anywhere. When Jesus aimed to give an exa example of humble, unselfish service, he hoped that the demonstration would impress his disciples as no mere new law could. And you know what? On the night, the disciples were jostling. They were fighting for position. I don't believe that they really took it on board. But after Jesus died, they really did take on board that he, being their master, was a servant. And he had served them because he loved them. While they were arguing, fighting over who was going to get the best jobs, there was no one there to do the foot washing. And Jesus steps in to show that he is the Son of Man and the Son of God. Let's continue on in verse 6. Then Jesus came to Simon Peter and Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Verse 7. Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Verse 8. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I do not wash you, you have what? You have no part with me. That takes us back to verse 7, friends. Jesus said to Peter, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will understand later. This morning as I was getting ready to leave to drive down here, I leave home at 8 a.m. I ran a little bit late this morning because the wallabies all lined up, especially the mums. You can't not feed the little mum wallabies with their little joey sticking their heads out. They're very cute. Uh, there's about four or five kangaroos and I was running late and I'm going, oh, and they're all actually just sitting up there like this. Oh, okay, Lynn's not here to feed them. So I ran into the shed and I fed them. But, you know, I was thinking that this time last year I was living in a caravan and every morning we would have to get out of the caravan and go up to the shower block and have a shower no matter what the temperature was, rain, hail or shine. You know, whatever trial and tragedy you're going through now, just think back to some of the low points in your life and you might think that now you are doing very, very well. And I think that's what Jesus is saying to Peter. Peter, you don't really in this moment when I wash your feet, you're not really going to get it. But you know what? If you follow me and you do what I ask you to do and you obey me, 
the meaning will come later. There's a Jewish understanding in the Old Testament, which we read as all that the Lord have said, we will do. But the Hebrew understanding of that is in the doing, there will be understanding. The Hebrew mind is a very practical mind. The Greek and Hebrew mind analyze from different angles and debate and argue the toss. But the Hebrew mind is, you know what? Let's just get that Ark of the Covenant on our shoulders and the priests march into the river. And when they march into the river, the river was flowing. But as they march into the river by faith, the river parted. It's the Hebrew mind. It's a mind of action and a mind of faith. Friends, whatever waters you are going through now, praise God for that trial and that test. What is God trying to get you ready for now that you may not be ready for? I'm talking about this direction here. What's he trying to get you ready for? To go to the kingdom of heaven. Do you think you're ready? If you think you are, then ask your partner <laughs> on the way home and then die at duck. All right, so God is allowing us to be pieces, blocks of wood put on the lathe. Have you ever seen it happen and the chisel goes in? And the wood starts screaming, doesn't it? It starts smoking. It's protesting. It's screaming. And then afterwards, after that wood's been polished and it's been painted, it's absolutely beautiful. And that's the same as Jesus polishes his gems. Church, I'm here to encourage you that whatever you're going through is not God cursing you. Yes, the devil's after you. Yes, he wants to kill you. Yes, he wants to give you a hard time. But Jesus is allowing it that you will lean harder on him. That's the whole point of it. So I'm telling you, as I've told my family in the last weekend, after they stayed with us, stop whinging. Give God the praise for whatever you're going through. It could be worse. Think back to other things that have happened. It could be worse. You are surrounded by blessings. Stay positive. Don't be like people who are always down on, one that, on what they're not up on. They're not the people you want to meet. So Jesus says, Peter, you don't get this, but you're not going to be a part of the kingdom if you don't do this. Well, does Peter tend to go from one extreme to the other? He's quite an amazing sanguine, isn't he? He's like, if there'd been a bucket of water there, he probably would have dived in. What does he say? Oh, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus says, look, basically, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean. So today you've probably had your shower last night or this morning, you are clean. But Jesus is referring to the uncleanliness that comes through our feet contacting the world and it's talking about sin. Sin is not spoken of as a big serious problem today in the Christian church, but it's the thing that tore Jesus out of heaven and put his back on that cross. Sin is rebellion and hatred and disregard for the things of God. Whether it's intentional or unintentional doesn't matter. It is all classed as rebellion against God and that's why we're here today because I know all of you fear God. If not, did your car break, out, break down out the front and you came in for a hot drink? You've come here to worship God and be challenged today, haven't you? What do you say? All right, so God has brought you here today to challenge you that he loves you. He's going to lift you up to a higher plane. And this is a cleansing and restoration service. Were all the disciples clean? They were not. It's a good job I wasn't Jesus. I would have asked Judas to do the foot washing. Put him under a little bit of pressure. That had happened, he might have left earlier. Verse 11, Jesus says, No, you're not all clean, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, You are not all clean. Friends, we've looked at John 13. It's an exclusive text. No other mention of foot washing in the New Testament in terms of that Last Supper. Verse 4, it's an act of humility. Verse 5, it shows Jesus being a servant. And here in verse 8, we have the ritual of inclusion. Peter's independent spirit and proud attitude were inconsistent with the character of those who enjoy spiritual fellowship with their Lord in this life and who entertain the what? 
the hope of enjoying eternal fellowship with him in the world to come. So Jesus said, Peter, you don't understand, but this is a gateway into the kingdom. This foot washing service is important that you kneel down and serve others. And then what do we read in verse 10 about cleansing and baptism? Verse 10 says, three things are being referred to here. Number one, being cleansed from your sin. And it refers back to your original baptism. So friends, the foot washing service is a mini what? It's a mini baptism, exactly. It also shows a renewed consecration to service and it's also a true spirit of Christian fellowship. Now, one of the things that I like to do when I'm washing someone's feet, and I'm lucky I get two communion services today and next week I get eight a year, um, is to ask them, uh, what can I pray for? What do you need from God? So I'm hoping today if you enter into that foot washing service, and not all of you will be able, but if you do, that you ask your partner that you're serving, can you pray for, to God for them for something that they need from God and continue to pray through them for them during the week. This is the true spirit of Christian fellowship. Let's pick it up in verse 12. So when Jesus had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me what? Teacher and Lord, 13, and you say, well, for so am I. If I then, 14, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Friends, Jesus is claiming here to be the Lord, the Lord God. Why would he do that when he's avoided that in his whole ministry? In the timeline, it's the Last Supper. Where is he heading? He's heading to the cross. He will be arrested in the garden that night like a wild animal sought by the temple priests. And so he's saying, you say that I'm your Lord and Master, and I am. He claims his rightful divinity, that he's 100% the Son of God, and yet he's 100% the Son of Man. 15, he says, I've given you example that you should do as I have done to you. Notice that? So this foot washing service coming back to what Paul said, Paul said here this morning, that most people don't understand the importance of it. For I've given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. Verse 16, most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. The King James uses another word starting with H. It says you'll be what? Be happy. Friends, what's the secret of happiness? Is it having a lot of money? a great job, a fantastic family, a loyal partner. Let me tell you what I believe happiness is. Happiness is being at peace with God. Someone who's at peace with God, are they afraid to die? If I have a car accident on my way home and I die, don't be grieving me because I have peace with God. I've, in, I've entered into an agreement that my life will end when he signs off on it. The devil can try and take me early, but God has to sign off it. That will be the right time for me to die. I have peace with God. It brings me tremendous satisfaction to know that this is the God who looks after me. The good shepherd will not let me be plucked out of his hand. Have a look in John chapter 10. All right. If you know these things, blessed are you and happy if you do them. Finally, why are we doing the communion service in terms of foot washing? Jesus commands it. So what's the whole point of the foot washing service? Very simply, Jesus gives us an example that we should follow. Now, today, whose feet are we going to wash? Today, in some churches, there's an Emphasis on families washing each other's feet. Others do the couples wash their feet. Traditionally, I have asked people to look for visitors because visitors, if it's their first time to a foot washing service, it's fairly confronting. So if there's someone here as a visitor, then you could ask them, would you like, to, um, would you like me to serve you? And they might say, no, I just want to sit it out today and that's fine. That would be acceptable. 
Um, I want to watch what's going on. Um, but sometimes it's a good thing to be able to go and ask someone if you can serve them. In ancient times, it was supposed to be a good idea that you went to your enemy at the communion service and said you want to wash their feet. After that, you have to duck. So basically what I think should be done is Matthew 18, 15 to 18 says, if you have a problem, go to the brother privately, off the church ground, sort it out during the week, and later that would have meaning after there has been reconciliation. So friends, the whole point of this Foot washing service is service to others. One of the youth outreach programs that was started in the Seventh day Adventist Church is called Stormco. And Stormco is an acronym. You ready? S T O R M C O. Service to others really matters. Company, Stormco. They go out to a town, they repaint the playground. They'd play with the kids, especially Indigenous children, and just love them and clothing and all sorts of things. You know, and so heaven is looking at your heart and your service to others, to bless others in the community. So friends, that's the brief biblical history of the foot washing service. And today, I just want to explain that we are right here. This is a Google map of our church. And... Uh, Ladies, we'll go out into the back room and gentlemen, we will meet just down here for the foot washing service. So we are now going to celebrate that foot washing service and I'm going to just say um, that as we separate, we're going to stand in a moment and um, Sharon, if you'd like to jump on the piano, we're going to sing that beautiful hymn, Wider Than Snow. So we're going to stand and sing Wider Than Snow. During that time, after verse 1, the ladies can just go up there. The men can come down there. If you would like to just stay and observe, then just stay in your seat or you can just have a few minutes um, break outside. Let's have a prayer. Father in heaven, please bless us now as we go into this service of humility and thank you for this opportunity that now we've remembered the meaning of it and we ask it in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.